Today we're going to look at an acquittal in Manhattan. It was a jury trial. The defendant was represented by Priya Chaudhry. Priya gives us a spicy statement after the verdict was announced. And with Jonathan Major's trial coming up in the same court system, this is Manhattan, this is DA Alvin Bragg, at some point this month. It's slated for the end of November, but who knows? I thought it would be good to look at. Lily and Flavio, thank you so much. Two different people sent me the story and asked if I heard about it. They are great. If they want to drop their Twitter handles in the comments or if they want me to add it to the bio, I'll do that. But they both sent me news of Adam Foss's acquittal. And we're going to start from the top level so you can get a quick summary. But really, just the food for thought that's been sparking for me. At a broader level, for anyone that might be interested in the Jonathan Majors case or what's going on with the Manhattan DA, hearing the story, even though there's not that many details about it, is really good food for thought. So if you have thoughts on anything watching this, please drop them in the comments. Hit me up on Twitter. Some things that I'm going to throw out there for you to think about is what is Alvin Bragg and the Manhattan DA's imperative? What's their mission? Also, how significant is it that this case that we're going to look at involves rape and assault charges? Jonathan Majors is a DV case. Both of those types of cases get certain types of, of privacy and restrictions from public view. By nature, they're just not the most publicly transparent processes. And third, and this is really important to me just in general, and without treating any two cases like they're the same, because we should never do that. What can the system do better? Is the system doing it right? Is there something they can do better? What can society do better? Because here we're going to see a much larger use of resources across three years that, that ends in an acquittal, which is if, if we think the state hasn't proved beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody's guilty, that is what we want. But at the same time, each time we're celebrating an acquittal, you've got to think about everything that leads up to it, the resources that go into the investigation, the stress and emotional toll it takes on anybody involved, both sides. And then in a situation where it's an acquittal, but maybe it shouldn't have been an acquittal, and this is not for any specific case, but that's a problem of its own, right? Because is that really justice? So just as we go through these things, always keep these top-level ideas in the back of your mind. Share your thoughts, because at the end of the day, these cases, at least for us, together, they're more than the sum of their parts. In 60 seconds, the case we're going to look at stems from an incident going back to 2017 in a Manhattan hotel. There was first an investigation in Boston, which we'll go over a little bit more, that found questionable but not criminal conduct. They interviewed 28 different individuals and examined records. Fast forward to August 2022, D.A. Alvin Bragg announced charges for FOSS, which were rape in the first degree and sexual assault in the first degree. But on Friday that just passed, so November 3rd, 2023, a jury acquitted the defendant. We'll go into some background context on the defendant and who he is. But in short, he was a former prosecutor in Suffolk County, Massachusetts. I say Suffolk because Long Island, New York, but I think Massachusetts is Suffolk County. It was a two-week trial, and there was more than one day of jury deliberations. And then the last kicker, his attorney was Priya Chaudhry. So that's Jonathan Major's defense attorney as well. And Chaudhry issued a statement, an exclusive statement, to News 1 after the verdict came through, in which she says that there is a concerning trend with the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's office to, quote, weaponize accusations where a black man is accused by a white woman, casting aside the need for robust evidence in favor of narrative-driven prosecutions, she wrote. Now, who is Adam Foss? Full name Adam John Foss. That's going to come into play. We'll see hashtags about it. He's a former Boston prosecutor and the founder of a nonprofit called Prosecutor Impact. So he's someone that's been going out and he's advocated for prosecutorial reform, trying to keep innocent black men out of prison. He's widely known for a TED Talk he did that has millions of views. He's even been endorsed by celebrities. He's been affiliated with people like John Legend, who we'll see when these accusations came out. John Legend went and publicly disavowed him on Twitter. So we're going to do this in a weird order. We're going to start with the acquittal. So that's here, and this happened on Friday. And the reason I want to start here is because it's really where we see Priya Chaudhry relevant. So if you're here because you just want to see what Priya is talking about, how this relates to the Manhattan DA, if there is or isn't a pattern that you might agree with the characterization that Priya has, has put forth on Bragg's office, we'll get that done. We'll get that out of the way. You can get caught up to speed and get out. And then if you want to stay for the details, we can look at it together, look at some of the social commentary, and have a broader conversation. So this is from the New York Times. This was written on Friday on November 3rd by Harubi Miko. And simply it starts, Manhattan jury clears ex-prosecutor of rape and assault charges. 
Adam Foss, a prominent criminal justice reform advocate, had been accused of assaulting a woman in a Midtown hotel room in 2017. A former Boston prosecutor who was charged with rape and sexual abuse in Manhattan last year was acquitted of all charges by a jury on Friday. The former prosecutor, Adam Foss, a prominent criminal justice reform advocate, was accused of raping a 25-year-old woman while she slept in a Midtown Manhattan hotel room in October 2017. Mr. Foss, 43, said their encounter was consensual. Mr. Foss's lawyer, Priya Chaudhry, said in a statement after the verdict that her client wanted to express his, quote, sincere appreciation to the jury and judge for their diligent discernment of the truth in a complex case. As Mr. Foss turns the page on this chapter, he looks forward to time with his wife and young son, she said, adding that he was carefully evaluating his legal options to address the grave impact these false accusations have had on his life. So, pin that because... You know, we're not going to see the flood of media coverage and social media reactions like we're seeing with Jonathan Majors, but that doesn't mean that doesn't damage someone's life, work, reputation, name, cause mental distress. And as someone that's been in the, the criminal justice system for a while, he might be pretty familiar with how these things translate into civil cases when, when necessary or viable. So, so pin that. We'll think about that through this video, but also if it comes up in the future, I really do enjoy following defamation cases. So maybe we'll do something on that. And a defamation case would put a lot more in the public eye than we will have with with a DV or sexual spe special victims crime case where things are largely sealed by protective order. Mr. Foss was a prosecutor in the Suffolk County, Massachusetts District Attorney's Office. He became nationally known after leaving the office in 2016 and starting the nonprofit organization Prosecutor Impact, which trained prosecutors in practices he believed could lower incarceration rates. A frequent speaker about mass incarceration, he was also featured as one of Fast Company's most creative people and the Roots 100 most influential Black Americans. The trial loss was significant for the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin L. Bragg, who has made the prosecution of sex crimes a priority. A spokeswoman for Bragg said prosecutors were disappointed by the verdict but respected the jury's decision. The verdict followed a two-week trial and several days of deliberations by the jury focused on what happened the night of Mr. Foss's encounter with the woman. The two exchanged texts and calls for about a month before meeting at the hotel, prosecutors said. While they were in the hotel room, prosecutors said the woman repeatedly rebuffed Mr. Foss's sexual advances before she fell asleep and he assaulted her. During closing arguments this week, Ms. Chaudhry sought to undermine the accuser's account as not credible. Ms. Chaudhry described her client's account of the night in th at the hotel in detail for the jury and cited texts exchanged between the woman and a friend later in which the woman described the night with Mr. Foss as cute and said he was, quote, beautiful. The woman's account of what happened changed after Miss Foss ghosted her, Chaudhry said. You may think that Mr. Foss should have been more considerate, Miss Chaudhry told the jury, adding, but that is far different than deciding beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed a rape. And that's the end of, of this quiddle story here. Before we look at the News 1 exclusive statements, I do want to look at this New York Post because we have another statement, Priya Gaye. And this actually came out on November 5th. And here, so the verdict, according to defense attorney Priya Chaudhry, is a, quote, testament to the fairness of our legal system when it functions properly. And we also have this new bit. This represents a misapplication of justice fueled by societal biases that have no place in a system pledged to fairness and equality. And that was in a statement just to the Post. And there's Foss signing a poster or a piece of art with John Legend. This is arraignment. So this is during his arraignment. And then we have this detail. So this is where the detail came from was this. Prosecutors said Foss took advantage of the woman as she slept, adding that she was, quote, was incapable of consent by reason of being physically helpless. And that was in the indictment. And so they include this picture of singer Reagan Seeley. She's publicly accused Adam Foss. But look what the New York Post says here. This goes back to the conversation of sex crimes, DV cases, have a much higher standard of privacy, and they're shaded from the public view, which lets to protect victims. But it also makes it harder for, for us as the public to, to get an idea of what really went on in the courtroom, what went on with the prosecution, what went on through the investigation. So even though we know for a fact Reagan Seeley publicly accused Adam Foss in a Medium post in 2020, the DA's office did not confirm if the accuser in its, in its case was Seeley because of its practice of not revealing victims' identities. And then in an email to the New York Post, a spokesperson for Bragg's office also said they're disappointed in the verdict that, quote, survivors of sexual assault deserve to have their day in court and our prosecutors fight every day to center and uplift their voices. 
So while we're disappointed, we sincerely thank the jury for its service and respect the verdict it, re the verdict it rendered. As such, we will decline to comment further at this time. And then let's get to the exclusive with News 1 to see a little bit more about what Priya Chaudhry says about Alvin Bragg. So Priya Chaudhry on Friday touted the not guilty verdict for Adam Foss. In doing so, Chaudhry claimed Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg ignored evidence that should have precluded any pr criminal charges against Foss, claims similar to those she's made about the District Attorney's Office case against Majors, who stands accused of domestic violence. In a pair of separate statements emailed to News One this weekend, Chaudhry also questioned the ethics of Bragg's office and cited an eagerness to bring hasty criminal charges, particularly when a black man is accused of a violent crime by a white woman, because it was clear to everyone that this case should never have been brought due to the overwhelming evidence of Mr. Foss's innocence and a total lack of credible evidence of the allegations, twice I made outreach efforts directly to DA Alvin Bragg prior to trial, including sending an eight-page letter that laid out the overwhelming exculpatory evidence and critical problems with his office's troubling conduct in initiating this case, Chaudhry said in one of two statements. DA Bragg totally ignored my outreach efforts and never agreed to even speak with me. And again, we know that she sent this letter to ADA Galloway. She's also provided exculpatory evidence and evidence that goes against the credibility of Grace Jabari, all for it to just be ignored. Chaudhry used Foss's acquittal as an opportunity to claim how media coverage of that case pushed storylines that a jury found to be untrue, something the lawyer has also alleged in Majors' case. So that's obviously been a big point of discussion on this channel. A lot of people have had this discussion on Twitter. Just the changing the reactions versus reality. It's a dynamic thing. And I honestly think that if it wasn't Priya Chaudhry, if it wasn't Alvin Bragg, we wouldn't even be hearing about this guy's acquittal, even though he does have some public stature. It's also a bit juicier to put in headlines that a prosecutor is accused of something. But I don't think the acquittal would even be getting the quite minimal coverage that I think it is if Priya Chaudhry wasn't on this case and wasn't out here slinging commentary over at Alvin Bragg's office and giving these exclusive comments to News One and the New York Post. Now, that's her strategy. That's an opinion. I personally think it's interesting that she's doing it. I know a lot of people say, like, attorneys should stop talking to the media, but I do think she's a bulldog out there. And I think that's the only reason we're hearing about some of the stuff in the Jonathan Majors case. And you're going to see here that there's barely any details available to the public about what happened here. So even though an acquittal ends this journey in the criminal court system, there's still that, that battle of the social reactions. But I digress. So she goes on. While initial reports of false allegations against Mr. Foss were widespread and vigorous, the news of Mr. Foss' acquittal has been met with a noticeable silence save for mention by a handful of outlets, which Chaudhry's going to, right? This is why they're mentioning the case. And I think the New York Times, they're going to cover a big thing about Bragg, right? This selective reporting does not serve the public interest and falls short of the media's duty to report not just allegations, but also resolutions, especially acquittals. The narrative around Mr. Foss's case demands a balanced examination, and we urge all media outlets to fulfill their role in providing comprehensive coverage of the entire story, including his complete vindication. Notably, and we're going to get into this if you stick around and want to look into this, I didn't really know what this meant when I read it and I went looking and I was, I have questions. Notably, Chaudhry ripped Bragg's office for allegedly deferring to, quote, social media posts as purported evidence instead of relying on a foundation of solid evidence, saying it is troubling and undermines the principles of due process and justice. It's my best guess that's what this refers to is that Alvin Bragg went and pulled tweets and didn't actually have these people come into court and sit there. Keep that in mind because that's why the reactions are so important. It's a dynamic relationship between reaction and reality because in this reality, this very real case, the reactions on social media were purported evidence. And then we have the same quote about weaponizing accusations. And then Chaudhry went on to accuse Bragg's office of having strayed from its mission to impartially uphold the law. Instead, it has drifted towards a path of character assassination and publicity-driven prosecution. So keep that in mind going back to the back and forth we're seeing where it's like Insider New York Post versus Variety and Rolling Stone in the Jonathan Majors case where we have all these exposés about other instances, other people that have come forward. You can jump to the end of the video if you want to see a little bit more on that. Use the timestamps. Now we're going to work backwards a little bit with this, right? Because we hear the story of the acquittal. I obviously have an affinity a topical affinity for information regarding the Jonathan Majors case right now. 
Same thing with Flavio and Lily, who both brought this case to my attention. So naturally, I had to work back and look and see, like, what is this case about? Because this is obviously a much higher brevity of a charge than Jonathan Majors has five charges sitting against him. But it's rape in the first degree. It was a bit different than an isolated tussle over a cell phone in a car. So we're going to work backwards. November 3rd, we see him acquitted. We see Adam Foss acquitted. He was indicted by the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg on August 16th, 2022. And we saw some coverage, some media coverage. It wasn't as huge as Jonathan Majors by any means, but there was decent coverage by major outlets. And in his official press statement, Alvin Bragg says, I thank this brave survivor who had the courage to come forward and share her story. Our Special Victims Division is survivor-centered and trauma-informed, and we encourage anyone who believes they've been the victim of a sex sex crime to call our hotline. So according to court documents and statements made on the record in court, on October 21st, 2017, Foss, a former prosecutor and public speaker, met the 25-year-old survivor at a Midtown hotel after exchanging calls and texts for approximately one month. After the survivor repeatedly said no to Foss's sexual advances, the two fell asleep before Foss allegedly raped the woman as she slept. So the charges were rape in the first degree and sexual abuse in the first degree. So both felonies. And then we have Assistant DA Shannon Lucy handling the prosecution of the case. And then we did have some coverage when this indictment came down. It reached overseas. The Daily Mail UK covered it. We have New York Post. We have some other outlets covering it. And really, the focus is an ex-prosecutor, right? Because that, that's the juice, right? You're supposed to be seeking truth, and here you are charged with a vicious crime. He was freed without bail and was granted supervised release, but he had to surrender his passport. Again, at this time, the spokesperson for the DA's office said they couldn't confirm whether the woman in the indictment was Seely. But in an essay on Medium, which we'll read, maybe, Seely claimed she told Foss, quote, I'm not having sex with you tonight. You're too drunk before repeatedly telling him to stop as he continued to try to initiate the sexual encounter. Finally, he relented, saying, Fine, night, Reagan, she wrote. But then in the middle of the night, Seely claimed she awoke to false having sex with her. I was in too much shock to say anything. I didn't tell him to stop. I froze, she wrote. Foss's lawyer, Robert Gottlieb, called the allegations preposterous and said the encounter was consensual. The complaining has numerous times made statements that reflect a consensual relationship that she wanted to continue even after the date that she alleges that a crime occurred. So that's why I'm saying, like, I, it seems like Seeley is the accuser that the Manhattan DA's case hinges on, right? That's where the statement and complaint came from, is this woman with this encounter that they had in October of 2017. Because the attorney is saying it. The New York Post is trying to get the DA to say it. And they're just like, no, we can't reveal the identity. There is evidence known to the prosecutors that even following the date at issue, the complaining witness sent texts and was sexing with her client in the hopes of continuing a sexual relationship. Gottlieb also said that racial dynamics were at play, with his client being black and the alleged victim being white. The words, the accusations, the attacks on him re- reflect long-standing racial stereotypical attacks on a black man, Gottlieb said. And then we do have, for eight years, he worked as assistant district attorney in Suffolk County, Massachusetts, so the Boston area. And then we see a mention here. Last year, Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins issued an apology to two women who interned in the office as students with and with whom Foss was allegedly unprofessional and inappropriate. The alleged conduct wasn't found to be criminal, Rollins said. So we'll take a a look at that. We'll take a look at Rachel Rollins' statement and get some background context on that Boston investigation that initially started after Seeley started posting about her experience. And then with the, Daily, with the Daily Mail article, we do have confirmation that they actually met at a conference. So they were speaking together through texts and calls for about a month. And then they met at a conference that another article said he was speaking at and she was performing at. And that the investigation was prompted when she later came forward. So let's go back a little bit more. Let's look at the initial allegation. It's a 15-minute read. I'll toss in the link. You can see it has 1.2 thousand claps, 11 comments. November 17th, 2020, so it's called The Wolf and the Whisper Network, A Rapist and a Feminist Tea, The Predator Hiding in Plain Sight. In 2017, I was raped by a progressive, liberal, acclaimed social justice advocate. Here's my story. And she does it in parts, so we'll get some quotes according to her. Nervous, he said. It was nearly my turn to hit the stage. Someone with a headshot had plonked me in a chair next to a strikingly good-looking dude in a fitted feminist t-shirt. I nodded and laughed. Tell me about it. He rolled his eyes, smiled at me, and winked. The small acknowledgement of of the insanity of the situation made me feel a bit better. Others speaking that day included Jennifer Garner, Cynthia Nixon, and Chelsea Manning. I'd sat next to the lead singer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers at breakfast. 
Now, pay attention to how she's writing this and describing the names, right? Mentioning being starstruck, name dropping, pin that. My performance went well. Afterwards, I sat back next to quote feminist to get demite. You're incredible, he said authentically. Thanks, I chirped. Good luck. He slayed it. His talk was about the prosecutor's role in criminal justice reform. He radiated charisma. I'd never heard of him, but a quick Google told me he was Adam John Foss, an ex-prosecutor whose 2016 TED Talk had over 2 million views. He'd worked with John Legend. Cool, I thought. So John Legend's name? That conference lasted four days, throughout which I spent quite a bit of time with Adam. He would catch my eye across the tent and wink. Usually, I'd find this gross. But with him, it didn't come across like that. It was our little in-joke. I want to let you know that I'm, I'm like blind reading this. So I didn't actually read this last night. I knew it was here and I saw her tweet it out. But I didn't actually read the whole thing. So I'm reading this as if I'm, I'm speculating that she is the Manhattan accuser and we don't have confirmation from the DA that she is the Manhattan accuser. And you should be aware of that as I'm reading this. If something piques my interest, it's piquing my interest because I'm already coming from that position. On Saturday night, I performed again, this time with the band. Where was the article where it said that they were both performing? Hold on, because, like, my confidence level is definitely above 50% that Reagan Seeley is the Manhattan, the accuser in Manhattan. Okay, wait, so Reagan Seeley's in an, I'm just trying to look for her age. After years in limbo finding, so she's in a New York Times article as the subject of a renter expose. She was 23 in 2015, which would make her 25 in 2017. Okay, so my confidence level's like, okay, honestly, it's like 85, 95%. Again, this is me. So I'm going to throw this link in my other section of my scratch pad if you want to look at this. I'll call it Reagan Seeley Age. Singer, songwriter, writing coach. Look at your apartment's kind of cute. I don't know why I'm looking at this. I just have it open. Three months later, I don't know if this is important. I'm just skimming this. I'm not really reading it. But three months later, in desperation, she texted a friend, Julie Scalfo, a contributor to the New York Times, who she asked if she could stay with her in her guest room until she figured things out. So for the next two years, she stayed there on and off. She's owning furniture for the first time in life. We have some name dropping again. Except for a huge, beautiful abstract painting of a woman, which I found on the street next door to Daniel Craig's house. How do you know that? How do you know that? Like, do people just, like, I guess you, like, learn things if you walk by it every day. But was she just in this interview, like, I found it on the street next to Daniel Craig, so I think it used to be Daniel Craig's painting and he threw it out? Or, anyway, this stuff is not important. I just saw that she is close friends and was roommates with a New York Times journalist. She's an aspiring writer, singer, artist, creative herself. And she was 25 in 2017, and the accuser was 25 in 2017 when the alleged incident occurred. Let's go back to her Medium post about her accusations. So we just got done with, like, how usually she thinks it's gross when men send her forward signals. But with Adam, it didn't come across like that. She still thinks he's authentic. On Saturday night, I performed again, this time with the band. He pushed his way to the front of the crowd and moshed right in front of me. Embarrassingly cute. At the after party, he lightly stroked my ankle all night. Usually, I would find that gross, too. A week later, we met up in New York City. I was invited to watch Ted Fellows practice their talks tonight, he said. But I blew it off because I was like, I just want to see Reagan. Wow, okay, I thought. We chatted for hours. It came so easily. He told me he was adopted, that his mom had died of cancer, showed me her tattoo on his arm. She had the same name as my mom. I told him about my background. I'd been in foster care and found writing and music as a way out of a dark place and wanted to help others do the same. We found we had a lot of unusual things in common. I was running a project that taught poetry and rap to criminal justice-involved communities. Adam was a major league criminal justice reform advocate. He was a role model and he liked me. I was running a project. What does she mean by project? So I'm going to link to this TED Talk that she did about this program. So why is a white girl from England here talking about rap. Got the knack and that's a fact, but this is not a hijack. It's crap and dealing with it that led me to this lyric. Cool music is a map pulled out of personal experience. So I was running a project that taught poetry and rap to criminal justice involved communities. Adam was a major league criminal justice reform advocate. He was a role model and he liked me. At the end of the night, he kissed me super gently. 
When he pulled away, he looked at the floor bashful and said, Did you feel that? Feel what? I said. No, no, never mind. If you don't know, then I'll ask you next time. After I left, he texted me simply, Ray, dot, dot, dot. A bit melodramatic, but I smiled all the way home. We texted every day. Our messages quickly became sexual. We'd also call at night when he seemed sad, alone, and usually drunk and or high. I asked him if he didn't have hoes in different area codes. He laughed. I don't have time for that, he said. You don't have a chick in each city, I asked. I'm in a different city right now, aren't I, he said, and I'm talking to you. He was 12 years older than me. He lived on the road and had a crazy and fast-growing, crazier career. I was a recent grad and struggling artist still living in a dorm room in Upper Manhattan. I didn't expect anything of him except friendship and possibly sex, but it became super intense super quickly. He made it that way. He would pour out to me about his work and changing the world and how lonely he was. We connected over trauma and abuse and a drive to make the world better for it. Don't make me fall in love with you, he said. He would message me through the day, thinking of you or wish you were here or perfect day for naked cuddles. The next time he was in New York City, he disappeared off text an hour or so before we were supposed to meet. I drew a sad face on a dick pic he'd sent me and sent it back to him. No answer. It concerned me more than it annoyed me. To go from how full-on he'd been to basically standing me up seemed odd. When I asked him the next day what happened, he texted back one word, depression. From then on, our late-night calls became dark, melancholy ordeals about his mental health. He told me how he always ruined everything, how he'd been suicidal, how he didn't think he would live this long. I'm a bad person, Reagan. But he kept texting and calling. Throughout the day, he would tell me how he spent his weekend partying with Jeff Bezos or brunching with Oprah, and he always had time for a few dirty texts. But every night was the same. New city, same drunk, sad, sleepless Adam. Here was this insanely successful, good-looking, witty reform advocate falling apart to me on the phone every night. The more he talked, the more I believed he'd be found dead in a hotel room one morning and I'd have been his last conversation. Even though I was younger, I'd face the demons he was fighting. I could be a shoulder, a smile, a voice on the end of the phone, I thought. He'd be the most depressed person I'd ever spoken to at midnight, then the horniest at 9 a.m., sexing me from his conferences. I was lover, sweet darling, baby, boo, babe, and later only Reagan again. And later only Reagan again. So according to her, what's this timeline? So they met. Then they're texting. They don't meet up this one conference he comes back. But they're still texting. And sometimes he's only calling her Reagan. So part two. A month passed this way. It seemed I was Adam's new favorite person and he was mine. One day, he was in town again giving a talk. I was at a birthday party, but I told him I could see him after. When I pulled up to his hotel, he was standing in the lobby, swaying, holding his phone up to his face like an old man. Holding his phone up to his face like an old man? What does that mean? Hold on, help me. What does that mean? He'd locked himself out of his room, so we went to the desk to get a temporary key card. In the elevator, he slurred his words. Upstairs, he lumbered into the room and collapsed on the far bed, phone up to his face again. I approached him. So, what do you want to do? I know exactly what I want to do, he said, putting one hand straight at my dress and grabbing me without looking up from his phone. We'd kissed before and sent extremely explicit texts, but this was our first real sexual contact. I laughed nervously and took a step back. His hand fell away. He stopped looking at his phone and switched his gaze to me. Stood there not knowing what to do. He grabbed the tie of my wrap dress and pulled, undoing it. I just stood there still. Adam took this as a cue and in under 60 seconds had stripped naked and was lying on the bed. At the time, all I could do was laugh. Come here, he said. I think you need to go to sleep, I laughed. Come here, he said, unsmiling. I'm not having sex with you tonight. You're too drunk. He started kissing me. We can make out, I thought. That's fine. He's clearly going to pass out soon. He was so very kissable. I let him take off my dress and pull down my underwear, naked cuddles. Stupid girl, someone would later tell me. So part two details everything in the hotel room. It's explicit. I do want to point out, she does say she said stop with foreplay type things. She details that as a teenager, she was groomed by a 30-year-old music teacher and had a bad relationship with dating and sex because of that. And that because of her discomfort and inability to set boundaries, that what happened this night was because of that. She's explaining to, in this write-up, that she's telling herself she needs to get to like this stuff or else she can't call herself a feminist. And she asks herself, what kind of woman doesn't want this? And then she describes, he fell asleep in a drunken, loud snoring, but then she woke up and that's when she was being raped. And she continues to ask, like, hadn't I wanted this? Had I done something in my sleep? Is it my fault? And then in part three, she talks about what happened after. So she said this didn't feel the same as the first instance of rape that she experienced. 
because she had a relationship with Adam. And that's understandable, right? You, that doesn't mean that something's not, not okay just because you have a relationship with someone. But then after this day, they move on and back home, she says, Adam texted again and asked what I was doing. And she says she told him I was in bed thinking about having sex with him again. Okay, hold on. So I had paraphrased some of this, and I didn't want to read the whole thing on YouTube because I don't know how YouTube works with certain words, but I've got to say this out. I originally summarized it as, I was in bed thinking about having sex with him again. But really what she says, I told him I was in bed thinking about riding his cock again. But if this is the DA, if this is the Manhattan witness, the DA said she was laying there powerless to do anything. So why would you say you would want to ride his cock again if you haven't already done that? And if you only had this one encounter, it's not like that could have happened before this hotel night. That would have been the circumstance where this could have happened. So I'm pausing mid- mid-editing to throw this in there. Let me know your thoughts. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. I was in bed thinking about having sex with him again. And then she says, even if she realized what it was when it happened, I never would have confronted Adam about it. My instincts told me to normalize, resexualize, smile, and carry on. I would never have pushed him over the emotional edge he tiptoed upon every night. And then she goes on, Adam became more distant after that night. We still texted and sexted, but not nearly as much. It sometimes go days without a reply from him. But then he would lay it on thick again. A month later, he showed up out of the blue at my dorm. He'd taken a 40-minute taxi ride from Times Square. I just wanted to see you, he said. We didn't have sex. He left after 20 minutes. Shortly after, he abruptly told me he couldn't give me what I needed as a friend and stopped responding to messages. A few months of silence later, we were booked on a gig together. Adam caught my eye through the crowd and winked at me. This time, I did find it gross. At the after party, he hung around me and my band until 6 a.m., flirting all night with another girl. He didn't realize she and I were friends. Whenever she wasn't paying attention, he would try to hold my hand. Finally, I plucked the courage to ask if we could talk. Why are you ignoring me? I asked. He was silent for a long time, and then he said, Reagan, we hardly know each other. We've interacted for a total of like five hours. My stomach dropped. I understood what was happening. I told you about my background, I said. If you just wanted to fuck, you could have gotten that anywhere. Why would you do that to someone like me? What is it you think you told me, he said. What is it you think I did? I abandoned the conversation. I felt humiliated, used, and stupid. I tried to move past what had happened, but it was hard. I couldn't believe how naive I'd been. I thought I'd put being such easy prey behind me in my teenage years. I stopped having sex, I started gaining weight, I became overly wary of men again. And then when she travels back home, that's when her friends point out that what happened to her was a crime. Almost a year after the night in the hotel, she joined the TED residency and describes that her first week was punctuated by the Christine Blasey Ford Brett Kavanaugh hearing, which was streaming on giant screens all through the office. Why I didn't report posters were popping up at every subway station around New York City. And then she's afraid because Ted announced that they're inviting previous speakers to the residency talks. She bursts into tears because Adam might come back. She told Ted about her situation and says that Ted told her they'd already heard similar things and that he was banned from their events. So this is why she began sharing her story with friends and describes it as kicking a hornet's nest. She says there was a dressmaker, a Ted administrator, an artist, a famous actress, a lawyer, an intern, a volunteer, a Hollywood manager, a nonprofit CEO friend of a friend, the friend of a stranger, a witness in one of his cases. Everywhere I went, I found a trail of humiliation and harm left by Adam. And then she pulls some quotes that she's heard from different people and then asks, why is anyone doing anything? She describes that she's hearing his name at Talks at Google, New York Times, Forbes Features, shout out on a Jaden Smith record, book deals, Netflix, celebrity followers. And then she puts more quotes, but you can read all this in detail if you want to. But I want to go down to this addendum and keep this video moving forward. I'm sorry if I didn't want to read, like, I don't know what YouTube does with certain things, but read this on, you can go read this if you want to read all the explicit details. But she adds this addendum and says, Since posting this piece, a number of women have publicly shared their experiences of harm inflicted by Adam across social media, and others have reached out to me personally. You can find those stories across platforms under the hashtag AdamJohnFoss. I've also tried to repost as many as I can on my Twitter page here. So she links her Twitter. I've also recently been made aware of a new Medium post written by a group of women who were knowingly infected by Adam with herpes. Though I was fortunate enough to not be infected by Adam, these stories are important and I stand with these women. And she tags her article, Me Too, 
Time's Up Movement, Sexual Assault, and Feminism. And then even though this is the tweet that she links in that Medium article, it has 53 likes, four reposts, three quotes. And I'm only pointing that out because if we're comparing this to Jonathan Majors, the scale of the reach is much smaller. But we do have the pairing of Adam John Foster's and Me Too as a hashtag. And then the other article she linked to is reported as a potential violation. I'll link to that in the scratch pen. Ella Dawson saying that in March 16, 2017, at a TED conference video filming, they connected that he said he had herpes. And then she compiles other experiences. AJF apparently told someone, if you stay with me, you wouldn't have to worry about telling anyone else the herpes. Because we both have it. Think about it. Talking about cheating, having to go back. Every time that they left, he would claim to be suicidal and say and send multiple lengthy emails. It took me almost a year of therapy to deal with the aftermath of my relationship with AJ. So there's four stories in here. And then there's a call to action. We believe that what we have experienced being knowingly infected with a lifelong disease should be considered criminal. We're adding our collective voices as a call to action to the organizations that continue to enable Adam and his harmful behavior by not using their words to denounce Adam, such as TED, Ashoka, One World, MIT, Suffolk Law School, and others. We urge you to check on your communities, remove him from your platforms, and direct any victims to the resources below. And then they link to the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, as well as the NYPD, the Manhattan DA's office, and two attorneys from a law firm in the Suffolk County area. And this was posted December 15th, 2020. So you can read Ella Dawson's story, but in summary, and again, this is my characterization of it, she summarizes meeting him, how he flattered her, but she said no to his advances. But she still says that she's a victim of sexual harassment, though her experience pales in comparison to Reagan's. But the reason this stuff is so important is because this is really the basis for what Priya Chaudhry was saying, that he was using social media posts as purported evidence. But to me, that sounds like none of these people actually testified. Ella Dawson can't be the Manhattan accuser because she says that she said no. She never went to a hotel with him. She never spent one-on-one -on -one time with him. But she feels like that could have been her. So we're about to go down the rabbit hole of social media reactions and reality and have that whole kind of back and forth. Look at that dynamic here. But in the middle of Ella Dawson writing her post and when Reagan Seeley wrote her Wolf and Whisper post, Rachel Rollins opened up an investigation. So this is the Suffolk County, Massachusetts, Boston area DA, releases a statement. She posted to her Twitter account, I'm aware and troubled by the allegations that a former SCDAO employee engaged in behavior that was either inappropriate, an abuse of his authority, unethical, or illegal. Every allegation will be investigated fairly and thoroughly. And then she puts the full release. She's saying that earlier this week, she became aware of a blog post entitled The Wolf and Whisper Network. The reason we saw Goodwin Proctor LLP in Reagan's blog post was Rollins enlisted them so that they could lead an independent investigation. So it's likely Goodwin Proctor, they're going to go through these 28 people and interview and investigate what they have to say. And they're apparently at the bottom here. It won't let me highlight because it's just a picture, but it says they'll be investigating allegations that could have civil or administrative ramifications in addition to the potential crimes. So now this is out on Twitter, right? They're starting the investigation. And then on April 15th, 2021, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office releases a statement that says, Review of Attorney Foss's behavior while a Suffolk County prosecutor finds troubling but not criminal behavior. So they say that there was some questionable behavior involving two young women interns, but it didn't constitute criminal conduct. And then they referenced that last November, a number of women alleged in print and online that Foss engaged in behavior that ranged from inappropriate and an abuse of his authority to unethical and criminal. And this is important because their scope, Goodwin Proctor, was directed to investigate whether there were allegations or evidence that Mr. Foss engaged in conduct during his tenure that violated policy, law, or ethical rules. So 2008 to 2016. Their review is now complete. They do mention that, as is typical with this type of investigation, several witnesses either declined to be interviewed or were non-responsive to their outreach. Most notably, through his counsel, Mr. Foss declined to be interviewed or respond to written questions. And that, in light of the sensitive nature of the investigation, the witnesses who did agree to speak with us did so on the condition of anonymity. We ultimately interviewed 28 people and conducted targeted searches of a vast collection of electronic documents. In sum, our investigation did not reveal evidence of any per se violation of any law, formal policy, or unethical rules by Mr. Falsch during his tenure as an ADA. 
That being said, our review identified evidence that Mr. Foss engaged in concerning conduct with at least two adult female office interns and students that violated informal expectations and norms. We did not, however, identify any evidence, past or present, that leadership was aware of Mr. Foss's misconduct. So you can read that official letter if you want in full. That's the takeaway. And again, it, the scope was limited to his tenure as an ADA. And then one last thing around the context of this Boston investigation. When the investigation was announced, Adam Foss did issue a statement. I have it posted here from someone that works for WBUR and at Boston's NPR news station. Deb Becker is her name. And this was Adam Foss's response statement. I have seen recent social media posts alleging improper conduct in my past. I recognize that some of my callous and insensitive behavior has caused many people anguish, but I deny any allegations of non-consensual sexual relations. With respect to District Attorney Rachel Rollins' recent statement referencing a pending investigation, I do not wish to compromise that process by commenting further. In addition, this is a more appropriate time for me to listen than to speak. So that's the full statement. And then before we get into some of the social media posts from Reagan and other people that shared their experiences, let's get the John Legend one out of the way. So on January 12th, 2021, this is before the findings came in from Goodwin Proctor. So in 2015, we, my organization Free America, helped elevate Adam John Foss and the concept of progressive prosecutors. I later learned that he used his platform to harm women. He used my name and association to gain to gain credibility, and while we are committed to a world where people's lives aren't defined by their mistakes, it's unacceptable to use one's power and influence to harm women. We are so sorry to all of the women he has harmed. So he notes here that he used my name and association to gain credibility. Now, this seems like it's referencing Reagan Seeley's story, where she explicitly states that he name-dropped John Legend. And then going back to November 2020, we see a Twitter thread where Reagan compiles Other stories of things that were shared to her, we have one from Danny was there, me too, nine years later, and he's still preying on women the same age as I was when I met him. One is missing. I was an intern and shadowed him the summer before my senior year of high school. I should have reported it at the time, but I didn't. I didn't think anyone would believe me. But see, this is where it's hard to say because it's vague, right? It's a vague adoption of Reagan Seeley's experience, but we don't know if it's a full adoption. We saw with Ella Dawson where she explicitly distanced herself from the experience that Reagan Seeley alleged that occurred to her, but did state that she experienced what she felt like was sexual harassment in terms of maybe like a relentless pursuit and kind of what felt like an invasive or pushy approach. But right now we don't have any specifics from Danny was there. We don't have specifics from Maddie Kilgannon. We have an anonymous that says, please don't share my name profile. I was involved with him as a student and him as a lecturer. I can speak to the truth behind your story. The texts are hauntingly similar. I'm so grateful for you sharing a story that should have never happened. I'm so sorry he did this to you and other women. Thank you for your voice and for doing the right thing. So this is still vague. You could read this in a lot of directions. On one hand, I think I'm so sorry he did this to you and other women, which means there, it, to me that alludes to something that that's part of your story he did not do to me. But at the same time, someone else could read this and I can speak to the truth behind your story. But the biggest takeaway from Reagan's story is the rape. So I can speak to the truth behind your story. Other people could read this to be the main thing that your story is about. I'm saying that's true because I've experienced it. And this shouldn't if this shouldn't invalidate anyone that, you know, he was texting me, I was his student, he was the lecturer, that's a position of power, probably not appropriate. I kind of wince at the idea of someone doing that. But at the same time, I am not a prosecutor. And opinions are different than criminal prosecution, which has standards, reasonable doubt. The burden of proof is on the prosecutor to prove these things. And we have Priya Chaudhry saying, hey, they're using these social posts, social media posts, which may be these that we're looking at right now. But these are vague. They don't really, these people are not saying, hey, he committed a crime against me too. They could be interpreted, but that's it. And if these people didn't appear under oath to say what they're saying, they can back up the truth as being. I have questions. I have questions about that. What's the foundation? Who's saying this? Who's testifying that? Who's willing to testify that this is true and authentic words that they sent to someone? 
So as we read these things, you know, you think about what what the individual post means, the integrity of the individual post is a separate thing from what one post can be interpreted to mean about someone else's story. Because again, this person's story of uncomfortable and unprofessional texting and DMing could be 100% true. But does that really carry any weight in saying, like, I can back up the truth of your claim of criminal behavior? When it comes to prosecution, if they were in fact using this screenshot or a social post like this to substantiate the story, is that fair? Is that just? Another, hey, please don't share my name, but a friend sent me your medium. I had a very similar situation with Adam. I was early 20s in New York City when he met me. All the texts seem so similar. I'm so sorry this happened to you too. He would text me sweet names and always sexual, then disappear for hours, days. We had sex multiple times, and I was pushed and I was pushed into it a few times. If I didn't want to have sex, he would stay up drinking all night while I went to sleep. I could interpret this two opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Like, at first she says, sorry this happened to you too. And then she says, I was pushed into sex a few times. So my, oh no, negative meter is over here. Like, that's not good. But then they say, if I didn't want to have sex. So this is like characterizing situations where she would say no, there's no consent. He would stay up drinking while I went to sleep. So that's confusing then, because then on the other side, I'm reading this like, when there wasn't consent, there was no sex. So, again, as an individual social post, this post is like, stay away, like, no, for this, this guy, not my type. Um, And that's very uncomfortable. Sounds like a player, possibly dishonest, possibly misleading. There's an element of ghosting, going silent. But... There's two parts of this that seem inconsistent about backing up the same criminal act that's alleged in Reagan Seeley's story. And it's anonymous, which is understandable, but it's still anonymous. And then Reagan shares some Instagram posts. I dated Adam John Foss for four years from 2012 to 2016. He's a master manipulator, a womanizer, a liar, a cheater, a gaslighter. This is much more than just a man who just cheats. Adam leverages the power of being a role model to manipulate and harm women. It was four years of emotional and mental abuse. Stand in solidarity with Reagan Seeley. Time to shout. Hashtag Adam John Foss. So relationships are complicated. This person may be completely valid in their perception of the four-year relationship and characterizing Adam as a manipulator, a liar, cheater, gaslighter. Yikes and yuck, right? But then... It was four years of emotional and mental abuse. So we don't have that physical, that assault, that thing that would back up and corroborate or add weight to the crux of the story, the criminal act. Another from Instagram, and if we can assume that Reagan like pulled these right away, it starts off three years ago, so 2017, I stopped talking to Adam John Foss. Instead, I started talking to women like me who knew the truth about him. We always knew he was a compulsive liar, a master manipulator, the falsest of idols, an addict, an abuser, a self-admitted monster. We tried to quietly tell book editors and social impact orgs that they had the wrong guy. They didn't want to listen, so now we're here. Reagan is the bravest among us. I'm grateful I get to support her. Now, that's interesting because I wonder, and we probably won't get to see it because there's like no public information. Maybe it'll, some will become unsealed. We can look at some motions or whatever. But we don't have a a good peek into how the Manhattan prosecution did their investigation. We don't have any motions. We don't have, we don't have the trial. We just have a few quotes from the trial and characterizations from the DA and Priya about the trial. And we know that we have an acquittal, right? We can only say that the jury did not think the state proved their case beyond reasonable doubt after deliberating for more than one day. But where it says we tried to quietly tell book editors and social impact organizations they had the wrong guy. Well, if these were emails, it's possible that something like this could have been subpoenaed to substantiate, even if people like Ali Hoffman didn't want to come testify under oath or be deposed or give a statement, it's possible that the prosecution could compel some of these organizations to produce records, email records regarding correspondence on this issue. But we won't be able to see that. At least we can't see that right now. And someone else saying, I've heard many of these stories firsthand. 
And then someone else saying, I know also know someone who had a similar experience with Adam John Foss. Please read Reagan's story. This behavior is not okay. So that really is a collection of we all heard collectively from other people, from someone else, stuff like this. Another that says, I was warned about Adam when I became an MIT fellow in a call to continue outing Adam and all predators. Please don't use my name or photo. I had a brief relationship with Adam in 2015. It was consensual. I completely believe your experiences and those of others, not only because I believe women, but also because his behavior and language and everything is identical. He has a clear pattern of choosing vulnerable women and manipulating them. I wish you healing and peace. So, like, that's negative yuck, right? I met him at the lowest point of my life. He knew and capitalized on that. I heard identical stories about his mom, his self-hatred and pity, all other women being toxic, his attachment to me being intense, etc. It was jarring to read everyone's experiences. He really had a script. So, again, like, that's really negative yuck. But as a prosecutor, had a brief relationship. It was consensual. Behavior language, no corroboration or claims of having experienced the same core allegation. Another anonymous that just says, same. If I kept a journal in 2018, 2019, it would read like this piece. Thank you for writing this and for all other things I'll never be able to name. I'm sending you all of my love. So same, that's vague, right? One could read this as everything that you said, literally everything, same. But it could also be a Got a vibe like the vibe you're describing here. And then Liz Lawton, Boston College. Wolf, I just wanted to reach out and say I'm so sorry that happened to you. My heart hurts to read about the experience you went through and that of so many others. I also wanted to say thank you a million times over. I was introduced to Adam in college through a professor who brought him to class as a speaker. We followed each other on Instagram and started DMing. The messages turned from friendly to inappropriate and unprofessional. I was caught between feeling gross and uncomfortable and wanting to continue the conversation as he was offering me mentorship and potential job opportunities. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your story. If I had not read about this, I very well could have met up with him in person and accepted a job under him. I do not want to envision where that could have taken me. You have saved myself and countless other women from so much potential harm. I am truly so grateful and I stand with and support you. So another person that got a bad vibe, really had a similar start with the messaging, thought that there was the job opportunities, and then thank God I didn't fall into that. So maybe that's a big yuck. But again, it doesn't go to the core allegation of something specific happening. And here we have an instance of receipts by the same person from the message that we just read. It says, pandemics don't stop, hashtag Adam John Foss, from making inappropriate advances. A Boston College professor connected us for job opportunity slash mentorship. Adam's inappropriate DMs left me feeling uncomfortable and uneasy, and the conversations occurred while he was on vacation with his partner. So she shares some of the texts. We've got four things here. Adam says, sad news. Let's hear it. It's impossible to zoom here. Shoot, crappy Wi-Fi? Yep. That does make for a great vacation, but not for this convo. Sad slash face. How does a phone call sound? Or we can wait until you're back home, whichever works. I want to see you, cry face. Ugh, I know, but video call is much better. When are you back home? August 10th. All good with me if we postpone until. And then I don't think this is the same. It jumps to something else. Yikes. Just reading outside by the lake. Very low-key day. Let me see. And then photo sent. Heart eye emoji. Wish I was sitting with you. And then this seems like a separate time. A new conversation starts. Hi, hope you're enjoying vacation. If today still works, I should be free pretty much any time before 4.30 PST, so just let me know when you're free to chat. I'll be free in 30 minutes, and then she heart reacts. Great. You have my email, so I'm free to Zoom whenever you are, but she answered exactly, almost exactly, 90 minutes later. And then I don't know if this is a continuation of where we left off. It's, like, cut off at the bottom. It's strange to miss someone I've never met. What did you do? I have no idea. I always get along with friendly people who like meeting slash talking to new people, so it's obvious we were going to be friends. And that's either a picture or a video. It might just be a still of a video. She heart reacts to it. Working. Hope the workday flies by so you can get to hiking. I know a video call is much better, but would a phone call tomorrow work? I... And then it skips to another thing. She is sending a picture of herself. This is July 30th at 6.38 a.m. It's a picture of her, like, pretending to hold a zebra up. Took everything I had not to pet it. 
I don't know if it's the pose or the smile, but despite the fact there's a zebra right there, you're still the best part of this picture. And then he sends a picture of what's presumably his own dog. Ha ha ha, thank you, thank you. Pharaoh looks adorable and happy. And then we have posts that were deleted, but she reacts and she says thank you as well. It's stories like yours that help me feel comfortable sharing what happened. And then we have some other social commentary. If you look under the hashtag from 2020 and 2022, you know, one about One World scrubbing Adam John Foss from their site as an author. Calls for people to come forward with their stories. If anyone he has given an STD, harmed, abused, or lied to. Okay, and then Ella Dawson explains. All of that other... And then circling back to Jonathan Majors, why this is relevant. It's obviously, it's the same. It's the Manhattan DA. It's Priya Chaudhry. It's t totally different charge. It's totally different case where you shouldn't be comparing specifics of the incidents, right? And what's alleged between two individual people and what happened in a specific event. We shouldn't do that. But when it comes to media reactions, reality, we don't really have much Jonathan Majors news, except that Marvel is pulling back from Jonathan Majors being the focus of any storylines. And then we also have what's being called an exclusive from Rolling Stone on November 1st from Cheyenne Roundtree. So that's Cheyenne Roundtree is the same Rolling Stone journalist that we've seen doing Jonathan Majors coverage. And from the headline, it looks like there's new details about the London police ongoing inquiry. And really the news we have here is a confirmation that there's an ongoing investigation into a report of physical assaults levied against Jonathan Majors. And this is just tying back into what we already heard and the Rolling Stone and Cheyenne Roundtree already reported that in the 115-page response to Majors' motion to dismiss, the prosecution added in some details about a London incident. And basically the new thing is physical assaults. So that's what's being confirmed right? That's what this exclusive is. We don't know exactly if Rolling Stone has anything else but a confirmation that there is an ongoing investigation, which we kind of already could presume last week. And the rest of the article just circles back to previous things from Variety and Rolling Stone by Tatiana Siegel and Cheyenne Roundtree. So there's this whole new article that's supposed to be some exclusive news that puts the phrase physical assaults into play, but it really only tells us that, yes, the investigation that we heard about a week and a half ago now is actually there is an investigation, which I don't think anyone really doubted that there was an investigation. But the rest of this article is rehashing stuff from the spring. It's like Cheyenne Roundtree referencing herself as her source under the guise of there being some new major information, some exclusive information. And I could only take that as to someone skim reading or who isn't aware of this, if they don't click these links to go back and see, they might not realize that this isn't anything new, that this is actually just going back to something Cheyenne Roundtree also reported on on June 29th. There's no new information. So the reason I thought that this was this came full circle is because now that we have a glimpse into Priya Chaudhry's characterization of the Adam Foss case, also thanks to Ella Dawson, we have a peek at the theory of her argument in the courtroom during trial. We have these statements coming back from the first stories we looked at from News 1, where Priya says that the district attorney is ignoring exculpatory evidence and trying to use social media posts as purported evidence, which we still don't know if any of these have really been substantiated. We can't tell. So we do have a parallel there with this idea that people are going out. Cheyenne Roundtree is like leading the charge to investigate through crowdsourcing, through and social media posts were referenced, the social media posts that have now been deleted of people that used to work on set and had issues with Jonathan Majors. And then the, while initial reports of false allegations against Mr. Foss were widespread and vigorous, the news of Mr. Foss's acquittal has been met with noticeable silence, save for mentions by a handful of outlets. Selective reporting doesn't serve the public interest. Using social media posts as purported evidence. And then furthermore, there is a concerning trend with the Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg's office to weaponize accusations where a black man is accused by a white woman, casting aside the need for robust evidence in favor of, of narrative-driven prosecutions. This represents a misapplication of justice fueled by societal biases that have no place in a system pledged to fairness and equality. And that instead, the DA's office has drifted towards a path of character assassination and publicity-driven prosecution. So that's really where I see this come full circle. It's my own opinion. You are totally welcome to have yours. It is my own opinion that there's a bunch of yuck about Adam Foss. I don't think it's fair to say that there are all these other victims that came forward to substantiate the core claim that rape and assault occurred because I didn't see one other person claim to have been assaulted or raped by Adam Foss. And I think that's 
a huge distinction. And if someone engages in bad behavior that isn't exactly the exact act being alleged against them, but it's something that could lead to that, that's where you need someone to testify to their experience. You need an expert witness to come and say how these could be contributing factors. And we don't know, we didn't hear from Ella Dawson, who's our only peek behind the courthouse doors, if any expert witnesses of this nature were called. We know that the social posts, as they stood, probably didn't get in. Honestly, people's feelings, people's perceptions are their feelings and perceptions. And that's a different side of the spectrum versus what we should expect for prosecutorial teams. Again, my opinions are my own. I'm always open to hear yours. I found this case very difficult to look at when I looked through the court system. Now that the, the court's over, there's another, there might be something coming up where some things will be unsealed and become more available in the public record. If Adam Foss does decide to move forward and take some type of case, maybe a defamation case, probably a lot more will become public. And if it was a just acquittal, that's anybody's right, right? Um, but at the same time, at a broader level, I mean, that's scary for someone that's a, a victim to want to go the route to present their case, to go the prosecution route. And not only does that fail, but then they have to worry about civil liability being sued and something that could become much more public. These are things that are worth considering and wondering how can we improve this system as a whole? What can we do to change the way this goes? And should we even be pursuing these cases that end in acquittals? Like, it's great to know that people aren't just automatically found guilty because we know not every single person that's accused of something is guilty, right? But at the same time, if these acquittals keep becoming more and more common and if what Priya is alleging is true, that you know, these things aren't ev evidence-based. They're just character assassination-based. They'll ignore the evidence, exculpatory evidence, just to bring something to trial. What kind of burden does this place on society? In general, again, this isn't about any one specific case. But yeah, just a lot of food for thought. This is really interesting to look into. So thank you to both Lily and Flavio for opening the rabbit hole for me, right? And as always, I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear if you even heard about this case because I hadn't. I don't... Based on the social media, the much lower engagements, interactions, especially when there was a whole hashtag for it, just really under the radar. And we can't, we don't have a, a behind the scenes eye at what the prosecution's investigation looked like, but maybe the legwork was done by social media. And is that always a bad thing, right? And we don't always know that the prosecution is, is doing a thorough investigation into things for better or for worse. So the best we can do is try to keep a clear and open mind, be comfortable asking questions, be comfortable believing, hey, if this is true, then what does this mean for that? And just being open. So even though I have my opinions and I have my stances, I do always try to be reasonable in how I came to them. And I do always want you to remember that when something's my opinion, you don't have to align with it. Um, and I encourage you to share your own. That's it for now. Take care. I'll be back with an update if anything happens with the Jonathan Majors trial. If you're into defamation cases like I am, I recently just covered the Ben Brody case against Elon Musk for defamation. Ben Brody was misidentified as a like, neo-Nazi right-wing protest goer when he wasn't even at the protest. And Mark Bankston, the attorney that helped secure the huge verdict in the Sandy Hook case against Alex Jones, took that case with Ben Brody. They filed it about a month ago. So if you're interested in some legal reading and whatever that is, that's the most recent video I posted. But you might not see a video from me until something new comes up with the Jonathan Majors case. But that's all. I hope this sparked some food for thought. Would love to hear you share and take care until next time.